I'm Nick Argy, and um, I was asked to talk a little bit about some of my background, so um, I'll try to keep it short. Um, I'm actually from Colorado. I was raised in Lakewood, and I got really excited in astronomy and belonged to the Denver Astronomical Society. And then during that time, I actually um, uh, was, when I was a junior member, gave a talk on the sun. And then last year, I was asked to give a talk to the Denver Astronomical Society, and they asked me to ask to talk on the sun, which was it was weird after 30 years giving this an updated version of, <laughs> of what we know. Um, so uh, I went. I wanted to be an astronomer. Went to the University of Arizona, um, and then went to the University of Minnesota, and uh, did galactic radio astronomy. So part of what I'm trying to tell you is like a lot of times if you try to think, a lot of people. There's a few people in this world that can plan what they're going to do and end up there, but I always wanted to be an astrophysicist, but I, I really got there through a really indirect way. Um, I taught at a small college, two colleges in Minnesota for a while, and then went and got my PhD at the University of, Min of uh, Delaware and um, wanted to be a, a, a professor and got a job at NOAA in doing space weather, which was a new thing. I didn't even know what it really was, to be honest with you. And so um, uh, and I started developing the model that I'm going to talk about, the Wang Shealy model that they've added my name to it's now RG. Um, it's operational at the National Weather Service since 2011. Uh, and then I went with the Air Force and to do more research and then finally ended up at NASA and with my official title as astrophysicist. So I guess I finally made it, but it took a while to get there. Anyway, um, just you know, keep your eyes open to opportunities because, um, and you know, there's always challenges, but you know, if you're persistent you, you know, and you really want it, you know, that's what it takes is just that persistence. And just be open to new paths and, and avenues is what I'd say. Um, so anyway, feel free to, um, I don't care if you interrupt me at all. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Crone and Solar Wind modeling. I'm gonna talk about uh, the, uh, uh, the WSA model, but I really can apply it to a lot of other models and, and ADAPT, which is a, a model that generates the data that drives coronal and solar wind models. And I'm talking about like uncertainties and problems and, and, and so forth all related to this. Um, so actually, now um, I know Barbara Thompson gave you a talk on um, question is, is pointing, but okay. I'm gonna give you a brief, really brief refresher on the Corona and Solar Wind. I know Barbara Thompson gave uh, you an overview of that and uh, she might've used even some of my slides. So if you, if you happen to see them, let me know, uh, or just you can sleep during that part. But I'm talking about how Right now, we still can't explain how the solar wind is accelerated. So we use it in empirical methods. And I'll, sh I'll show you one method that uses something called flux tube expansion factor and the coronal boundary distance. I'll explain the, the WSA model. Um, it's, it's a coronal and solar wind model. Uh, I'll explain so, uh, the photospheric, uh, the, the boundary, the values, the magnetic field of the sun is the key driver to these models, all the models. And I'll talk to you about some of the complications with that talk about one of the models in particular that's working to help resolve some of the problems. It's not perfect. And then really about how do you validate and constrain models? I mean, that's one of the problems is there's still so much uncertainty. We need to know like, how are we doing it right? And if I have time, I can skip this part, but just forecasting magnetic connectivity between the spacecraft and the sun. But I, I may skip that if we have to run out of time. Okay. so. Uh, this is on the left is just a cartoon on the right is a data and just the, for completeness. Uh, they're, they're not the same thing. I mean, they're not, um, uh, th this is not a cartoon of the right, but it looks kind of close and that's why I included it. Uh, but the sun's a hot magnetized, ionized magnetized plasma and, um, and uh, it's, it's magnetic. And so you have regions on the sun uh, that are, what do we call closed? And that's, you know, a bar magnet, you always have, the field goes from positive, negative. Um, and, um, and then you have regions that, are what are called open. And that may seem contradictory because you know, that's not true. But what happens is the sun's so hot, the atmosphere of the corona is a million degrees and it's so hot it can, uh, it can actually pull a uh, flow out then it drags a magnetic field with it. Um, there's something called the frozen in flux concept which is when you have a hot ionized plasma that's highly conducting the gas and the magnetic field go together. And there's a parameter called beta which is the, the ratio of the gas pressure over the magnetic pressure. And um, the gas pressure, I think, you know, NKT, the, uh, the magnetic pressure is related to the field squared. 
And what happens is that the photosphere, it's about one, depending on where, if you're in a sunspot, it's really low. If you're outside, it's about one. So that means that like at the sun, sometimes the gas can push the magnetic field around, sometimes the field will push the gas around. But once you get up into the corona, uh, beta is really low. And as a result, the gas goes where the field goes. I mean, so the field's really controlling things. And then as you get further out into space, um, and, th and this is also why when the sun, it's really hot. And so uh, when this gas is so hot, it starts flowing away and it drags the field out. And that's what opens up these regions here and form the solar wind, okay? And so you're gonna hear a lot about the solar wind. And here's just a movie, it's an old movie. Uh, but this is an artificial eclipse of the sun. Uh, used to, the, um, the white disc is, is, just the, the, uh, is where the sun is and the, 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 the circular uh, dark red region is the, the occulter. Oops, sorry, let me see if I can get this to run. I, I know I included the movies here. And if you, I don't know if you can see, but if you look closely, you actually can even see the gas flowing you can see plasma flowing away. They usually need to look at this in the uh, darker room. So these regions here correspond to, to regions like this right here, the closed regions. They're, they're bright because they're closed and there's lots of gas, there's a lot of electrons. So light from the sun's photosphere goes up, scatters off the electrons and you see this what is called a white light image. Um, but you see that in, in the real world that the sun's not static. This pointer is really hard. Um, the sun's not static, but actually, um, uh, uh, erupts and uh, eventually it, it, it's time to pin it and eventually erupts. So there you go right there, you see these eruptions and those are coronal mass ejections. I'm gonna be focusing more on the steady stuff, the stuff that comes out uh, right up here in the pole and so forth or in, in open regions. And um, so that's your brief overview of the corona. Oops, sorry. All right. Just a little bit more details. One is, uh, so uh, there's a theoretical definition of, of open region on the sun. And from a model, that means the magnetic field doesn't return back to the sun. It flows out into heliospheric space. Uh, there's, but years before that, there was observational where you see dark regions. And those are the, 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 um, um, the observational definition of a corona hole. And it's a region of low emission. What happens is the gas flows out and you know, up in here in this, in the, in the, this northern region here, it flows out and there's fewer electrons, so it's not as bright, all right? So this is actually uh, a model of the sun. So the, the, the gray, uh, the dark gray, light gray, is, dark gray is inward directed, white, light gray is, uh, or white is inward, outward rather. And the, the, this is the field. So those are data, but the field lines are a model. And you can see it sort of matches, uh, this is, um, the sun at about one and a half million degree temperatures. It's a little hard to see, but there's a dark region right here. That's this polar hole corresponds to this. And white light, it, it's this right here. You can see these are the open regions and here's the closed regions. It's always interesting to overlay those. And you see, that's not too bad for a simple model. You know, it actually, it captures the open regions pretty okay here. It's not perfect, but uh, it's, it's il illustrative. Okay, so, um, you know, everybody's interested in flares and CMEs, but why do you care about the ambient solar wind? And, and what is it? Ambient solar wind is a steady wind that flows out of the, out of the corona, coronal holes. And it's, it's, it's hot ionized magnetized plasma that flows out. And at the simplest level, you can separate into fast and slow wind. Fast is anything about 400 kilometers a second. Slow is anything below. Of course, if you do studies, this is far too simplistic and there's, it's a, it's a um, whole study. And so we, we have probably a better understanding of the fast wind and the slow wind is very complicated and may have multiple sources. Okay, so let me just, uh, just a little bit more introductory material. Um, I didn't know this when I started as I was doing, I was actually gonna do a solar wind model. I didn't know this because I'd been doing other topics. And um, when I started uh, uh, with my PhD, but the thing is, uh, as I told you, the, the, the gas and the magnetic field flow together. And so what happens is the sun rotates, you actually fly, you develop this um, uh, spiral pattern. And what you get here is the sun at the equator rotates about two kilometers per second at the equator, but the wind's about 400 kilometers a second on average. 
And so the, 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 the flow is really radial, almost primarily fully radial. And if you watch a little parcel here, this little red, red region here, it's, 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 it's um, hooked into the sun's surface and then gas pull, you know, then it's get, it gets pulled out as it flows. And um, so a, a little while later, and remember the wind is radial. Okay, so every one of these, these parcels are radial. So this one left a little while ago. Now the sun's rotated and now this isn't gonna leave. If you just walk through it, you form, tell that's radial, but it's forming the spiral pattern called um, the Parker spiral. And so at Earth, at, at roughly 400 kilometers a second, it's a 45 degree angle. And um, I'll leave the rest of this, you can, you can read that. It, it turns out that R drops off as one over R squared. Tangentially though, it's, it's one over R. So as you get further out, the uh, tangential component uh, right here dominates, but that's far out. All right, so um, one of the, so back when I, uh, actually long before I started, they were trying to come up with a way how to predict the solar wind. We still don't understand the mechanism, uh, fully understand how the solar winds accelerated. And they were grappling for how to do it. And Yiming Wang and Neil Shealy at, at uh, the Naval Research Laboratory were exploring this. Yiming came ac and, um, across some papers um, that uh, talked about something called magnetic expansion factor. But let me just uh, state right here. So here's an example of the, this is a modern day image of the sun. And there's the coronal hole right here. That's the open region that produces solar wind. And if this is an equatorial region, and every time that passed by, they would see a high speed wind. In other words, like 700 kilometers a second, you know, every time it rotated. And they thought there had to be a connection. Uh, one, they, they, they concluded, well, these have to be open regions because we're getting all this plasma. And then uh, they, they came with the idea of this, something called magnetic expansion factor, which is the rate at which the field expands from the surface out into the chrono. So it's like a trumpet. So if it goes a lot, it's a big expansion factor. If it goes a little, small expansion factor. And um, going through the literature and also just working with some models at the centers of these coronal holes, right here, I don't know if I can see that, right in there in the middle, the, ex the expansion factors are small. And Yi Ming thought, let me try looking at expansion factor and velocity and see if there's this correlation or not. And sure enough, what he found was there was an inverse correlation um, right here. The dotted lines, this is highly average over this of three rotations of the sun averages, like 80 day averages of the solar wind. So it's very smooth. And the dotted line here is uh, the observations and the black line are simulations. And it's surprisingly good, right? Now this is very average. So I was hired to take this concept and could this work on a daily or real time forecast mode where it's sort of like on an average and so forth. And I'm still here, so it, it, it did, um, fortunately, we were, we were worried. Um, but just to summarize here, just getting the same old cartoon that you saw. In the center is a small expansion at the edges. I've sort of embellished here, big expansion. So slow wind near the boundaries, fast wind at the equator. I mean, at the uh, center of the um, coronal hole. All right. so. One of the big problems that we had or have still is that it's very difficult to measure the sun's magnetic field in the sun's atmosphere. Um, they're just beginning to do it and you get, you know, um, and it's something that's not routinely done. And back in the, the you know, decades ago, it wasn't being done and they needed um, models of the, the corona. And it turns out that since about the 60s and actually over hundred years, they've actually been measuring the magnetic field at the sun's surface. And since the 60s, every day roughly. And so um, the driver of these data are the sun's magnetic field. So at the surface here with the photosphere, we have routine observations uh, of the sun's magnetic field. Every day now through spacecraft or ground-based observations are made. And again, this is developed in the late 60s. There's a simple model called the potential field source surface model. And it, it's sort of surprising that it works as well as it does. If you think about it, it's not overly shocking, but you have to think about it. But what, what they, they, you know, they didn't have the kind of computational resources nowadays that, uh, that back then that they do nowadays. 
So they, they thought, well, let's, let's start with um, Ampere's law. And, uh, now, and let's assume there's no current in the sun's chrono, which is kind of crazy because the sun's extremely conducting. So like, you know, it, but, and I could actually, if one of the questions you could ask me later is why, why is that not such a bad assumption? But if you assume there's no currents in the sun's chrono, then you can write the mag, you can write the magnetic field uh, as a gradient to, you know, uh, as, you can, as a gradient. And so you can, uh, you can put this into here and it'll be zero. And then you can use the, the, the div B equals zero. And if you put that into here, you get both Plasse's equation. Don't need to go through all the, the math and so forth, just a little bit. But the bottom line, this is a well-known solution that's been known for you know centuries or, and uh, so you can surmise the whole solution of the sun. And the only const uh, construct they had to do was um, they needed the lower boundary condition was the sun's magnetic field observations. And the other assumption was at this outer boundary, they imagine there was this boundary called a source surface. It's a mathematical con construct, it's not real. But the, it, it says everything at that surface is radial and open. And all they really are doing is it's just imposing like an energy equation, a relation. So what happens is you can imagine the sun, here's a closed field. The sun's really hot, it starts pulling it open, the wind flows, it blows out what? Radially, right? So eventually the field goes radial. So that's why they made that assumption. And given these two boundary conditions, you can solve the field everywhere inside here. And you can see you, um, you have closed field regions and open field regions. And here's even a, a little better example of where you expect fast wind. And you can see how this expands a lot, slow wind. And, uh, and then I was actually uh, hired to put this in to work it towards operation. And you get a solution that looks like that. Uh, yellow are the closed regions, fields that go you know, from one point to another point on the corona. Red is the outward magnetic field that flows out into the heliosphere. Blue is the inward directed magnetic field. It too flows out into the heliosphere. We're, I was just talking about the sign of the field. And um, I'm not gonna go into too much details about that, but it turns out that this uh, radial boundary condition that close is not the best assumption. And they also need a gap filler for more advanced models that um, um, WCA is sometimes used to drive magnetohydrodynamic hydrodynamic solar wind models. Uh, and so this uh, uh, second model called the current sheet model is just another potential field model with different boundary conditions. And that together is the WSA model along with the empirical relationship. Uh, and actually it's uh, this outer boundary, uh, we, we drive it with a simple 1D kinematic model that works very fast, obviously. And, but there's Inlil, which is the operational model at NOAA for the solar wind. But there's a whole bunch of other European model, Euphora, and other models that start with this boundary conditions generated by WSA, and then and then they're used to drive the MHD solutions out into the heliosphere. Okay. Okay. So um, what what you need, and I explained, is you need a map of the sun's magnetic field. Sun's magnetic field. All right, now, if you think about that, this is great. You know, it's a 360, but just think about it. We only see one side of the sun and it, it rotates in 27, 28 days. And so this map had to be constructed from a whole bunch of stuff and the sun's field of changes. And so there's where I'm gonna go into that in more depth, but if you put those together, you get a global map of the sun and you put it in model and you get the global magnetic field out to um, wherever you want it pretty much. And then you drive a solar wind. And so at this outer boundary here, uh, you get the magnetic field. And you can see that it's, it's greatly simplified from this complicated, these are active regions, sort of where sunspots are, positive field and uh, negative field. And then, um, and, but once it gets up into the, uh, out into you know five solar radii, for example, it really simplifies to negative and positive, and there's this thin current sheet. That's where the field reverses. Um, if you trace the magnetic, now remember everything in this outer boundary is open. So if you trace field lines down to the surface, uh, you um, this is open. This is where the solar wind's coming from. 
you trace it down, you'll land on the, on the photosphere. So this light and dark is just this map converted to pluses and minuses, just to keep things simple. And uh, so if you trace down to the surface, this is where the coronal holes are, or the, where the solar wind's coming from, right in here. And everything else is close. It's the, it's the yellow lines that, that I showed in that, that rotating movie. Okay, um, notice that even if you're here, if you trace the solar, if you trace this magnetic field line, you can end up somewhere else. You can end up at the poles. You don't end up at the equator. You actually end up at the pole. So it's a little more complicated than you think. Um, here's a, if you use an empirical relationship, you can get the solar wind speed. And so this is slow wind, fast wind is red. Um, these little lines indicate where does the solar wind come from? So on this date here, which I, I can't read right now, but it's something like May 4th or something. If you trace down from here down to the surface, you can see that it came from this region here. So that's what that's telling you, is the connection from the outer boundary to the photosphere. And here's just an example that I pulled that it's just, you're gonna see a lot of these diagrams here. This is for solar orbiter, which is spacecraft, a European spacecraft that's orbiting the sun about um, from something like 0.3 to 0.8 uh, AU. And what this is is, is uh, um, the model predicting where is the solar wind come from? So here is the speed predicted today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, along with the speed. And there's a sign here, if you can read it, um, of either is it going away or from. So this is saying where the solar wind's coming from and what the spacecraft's seeing. And then this is at five solar radii, and it's just showing you um, that the, the magnetic field's high up in the corona. And, and um, I'm not gonna let, this is like a month long movie. I won't go through the whole thing, but it allows forecasters to see where is the solar, if we're, the solar wind we're seeing at the spacecraft or at Earth or wherever you're observing, where did it come from? And uh, what, you know, and, and also predicts in advance. So it's kind of fun to watch. All right, so uh, Yi Ming Wang uh, developed this, uh, he had a very coarse, he just did it by ranges of expansion factor. I converted it into an empirical, formula because I needed to do it for practical operations. And then it turned out that you just, I, I, this is a long lecture, but I'm not gonna go into, it didn't give high speeds where it was supposed to. And so another person, Pete Riley, had this idea about using the distance from the, the point where the magnetic field lands to the nearest coronal hole boundary, like how, how deep inside a coronal hole you are. That's what that theta means. And so there's a more complicated formula here um, that involves both speed, expansion factor rather, and coronal hole boundary distance. And it's really pretty simple. It looks complicated, but it's really just this relationship above by this little factor here. And if, if this is zero, then this is just a very small number and it gives you slow speeds. And if, if this is infinity, this goes away and you get, it's, a, it's just a bigger number right here. I sort of visualize this thing as a factor that adjusts the 625. And you can see how it works. This is coronal boundary distance. And you see that the transition from slow wind, from, from near the boundary, the edge of a coronal hole to the deep inside, it's very rapid, just a couple of degrees. And you go from very slow to very fast, very quickly. And the, the, the different lines are just the different expansion factors. But what you see is when you keep, what it does is when you get deep in a hole, you get some very fast speeds. And here's an example of, of an actual run uh, actually, the movie I was showing you that was of the, of the solar orbiter, here's actually the predictions the model generates. Uh, here's the input map. Here's the outer boundary. Um, and, um, and this is the connectivity. And so this is, uh, let's start down here. It's easier to follow this. This is solar wind speed as a function of uh, time, uh, one rotation of the sun. The model is an ensemble. It actually creates many, many predictions. And the blue dots are the average. And the, the vertical blue bars are the maximum and the red are the standard deviation. And you can see here, you're doing, uh, of course they, they cherry pick this one, but um, so, uh, cause it, you know, obviously it's forecast model doesn't do, always do as well. But you can see it's actually capturing the structure pretty well. This is polarity, outward is positive, this upper line and downward is uh, uh, this down here, it's negative. Uh, black at, in both cases are the observations. Uh, speed bot at the bottom is the, is the speed from orbiter. And it, the, the, the data are, are high cadence, kind of noisy, but it, you can see it's actually capturing the positive, positive part pretty okay. And here's a data gap. 
Um, and uh, the blue big blue dots are the average. Okay. Uh, this is just sort of a general slide. This was uh, WSA Inlo was put into operations in 2011. It's now being upgraded um, to 5.4. And um, uh, this originally uh, was an Air Force, NOAA, and, and uh, a, a NSF funded effort called CISM was that, that put this into operation. Um, have you guys seen the Enlo model? Okay, so here's, so you know what this is. That little white dots or little blue, uh, yellow dot is that's WSA. We, it, 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 I don't, sometimes it doesn't get as much credit as this deserves because, so anyway. <laughs> but, so this is in the ecliptic and these are like this stereo A and B and earth. And this is the meridional cut. And it's just, this is density and this is speed. And this is what is used in operation. All right, so just how am I doing time wise? So I, I, I alluded to this, even mentioned it, but these data are the key drivers to all, virtually all chronal and solar wind models. And uh, they're, so they're vital. And um, the sun rotates in 27 days, all right? So the, the conundrum is how do you make a global map? And really the only way to do it is to watch the sun for 27 days. And so the old style way of doing this was you take the sort of a strip at the central meridian and put it here and you take a whole bunch of them and line them up and you create a map. But the problem with it is, is this was the, the blue one was created 27 days earlier than the red one. And, and the sun tends to evolve a lot. And so this is not what the sun looks like right now. It's, it's what Jack Harvey, uh, who's a solar physicist said, it's time history of central meridian. We don't want a time, to, uh, time history of central meridian. We want a snapshot or a synchronic map of the sun. What does it look like right now? And um, it, these maps do not account for the fact that the sun rotates faster at the equator, right here, than at the poles. It's called differential rotation. It doesn't account for the fact that there's these flows that drag many filled up to the poles. And, and they, uh, this doesn't account for the fact that these active regions evolve and dissipate and so forth. So there's no di uh, differential rotation, marine flows, super granulation. But in the next slide, I'm gonna talk about um, uh, flux transport models that we'll take to it, uh, that will help, ad help um, address that. Um, but one thing it doesn't, none of these models do is emergence. We can't predict the emergence of, of, of active regions. And of course, you don't see the far side of the sun. So of course they emerge on the far side and it actually can affect the global solution. So there's stuff on the far side of the sun, we don't see it and your solution can be messed up. Uh, your global solution can be messed up because you don't know about it. So we need a uh, four pi global observations of the sun's field. And that's, of course that's extensive and challenging. Uh, so years ago, when I started the Air Force, we come up with the idea of developing a flux transport model that it, it was data simulative. So the idea of a flux transport model wasn't new, but this actually uses real data simulation where it takes into account the model's uncertainty and the uncertainty in data and puts it together and evolves it. So what ADAPT does is it takes a map, however you got it, it takes an observation, merges it using weighting it based on the reliability of the uncertainty in the model and the data, then evolves it, assimilates, evolves, assimilates, and so forth. And you get this right here. And um, so this uh, accounts for factors that we don't, that I talked about, differential rotation and so forth. Uh, and so, uh, and then we assimilate data as we get new observations. This was an effort to provide a more realistic map of the sun's magnetic field. But again, the problem is we don't know what's going on on the far side of the sun. Uh, just a little bit more about ADAPT, but I, I kind of explained most of it. It accounts for the difference rotation, meridional flows, um, and, and the, 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 um, basically what's called supergranulation, these big, large flows that actually push the field around and cause it to dissipate. The thing about ADAPT is it's an ensemble. So what we do is we don't generate just one solution of the photospheric field. We, we actually generate a, an ensemble of solutions. And so what you're seeing here, Right here, oops, sorry. Where did I do it? Sorry. This is actually a composite of 12 different, it's not a movie in time, it's actually right now, but 12 different possibilities of the state of the sun. And you can see that right here, we assimilated data right on the seam right here. 
So you see the data is not changing much because we just added that. But on the far side of the sun, it's, it's quite a bit different. Uh, if we did it right, which is questionable, um, we would be, you know, if the ensemble is right, we would represent the total, you know, the, the realistic represent the spread and, the, and our knowledge of the uncertainty. I think it's under constraint just because we, we just don't know how to do it well yet, but we're trying. Um, so here's some, some of the problems is with um, these data. And again, it, this is really critical because if we try to do coronal studies, you drive with, uh, with these maps. And if you're trying to compare one model to another model, I mean, it's not unusual for one group to do one set of magnetograms, another group do a different set of magnetograms, or they modify their, their that's, they can use the same map, but then play with it differently. And it's like really hard to disentangle all this stuff. So one thing is if an active region uh, uh, emerges on the far side, we don't know about it, that can change the solution. Sometimes these active regions emerge, they rotate, and we only catch the first half of it when we make the map. And so now we've created a magnetic monopole, which is not real. And so we have to fix it, but it's like, it's not obvious how to fix it, but that can cause all sorts of problems with the solutions. The other thing is we don't see the sun's, oh, let's see if I can, let me jump to here. Uh, we don't see the sun's poles well. Um, in fact, we don't see some of it for, for like months. And, and so during September, we don't see the South Pole. And in March, we don't see the North Pole. And even when we see it, it's at really highly inclined angle. So the, the, the data is the most uncertain at the poles. And unfortunately, the, the, well, the sun comes in uh, little bipoles, like little teeny re active regions. By, and the, with the largest bipole of the sun or dipole is the polar field, north and south. And if you, if you decompose the sun's magnetic field, into spherical harmonics or like a dipole, a quadrupole. The, the most important, the, all the terms, the other ones drop off and the most important term is the dipole. And where is, our, where is our most uncertain observations? It's at the poles that really dictate the form of the di dipole. And so this is the things that we're struggling with is that our, our observations are, are, are uh, bad at the limb and, at the, and therefore at the poles. And the model is extremely sensitive to that. I should have put this in a different order. Um, so here's another, just an example of the model. This is looking at stereo B in 2010. So stereo B was over there to the left in that center diagram. And this is the, this is uh, WSA, and this is different possible solutions. Um, of, uh, this is actually one moment in time. And then what we actually did is we take one moment in time, 12 possibilities, next day, 12, next day, next day, next day, and to create these, these solutions here. And let's just for the just sake of time, look at the, the velocity as a function of time. And again, it's a it's stereo B. The black line stereo B, uh, are the observations and the blue is the model. And you see, well, you're not doing too bad actually, but you are greatly over predicting this region. You'll have to take my word for it, but that's coming from this coronal hole right here. And it turns out though, what happened was, this is just an average. So you can see on average, we're doing pretty well. It actually turned out that on the far side, there was actually an active region on the far side. And you can see it, how, how much did it change the solution to, in the current sheet? Quite a bit. It actually made this a lot smaller. And you can see now, that we're capturing this, this, this region right here from that coronal hole right there pretty well. So you can see it makes a bit of a difference. Notice that active region is the north, but it's affecting the southern polar hole. I mean, uh, polar uh, uh, coronal hole rather. And so you see there's all these subtleties. Uh, so it's just an example of why, why things can go wrong. Uh, the polar fills, this is just an example. This again is one moment at a time. And look at the solutions down here on the, um, well, first of all, just look at the magnetic fields. This is 12 different solutions. Does it really look that different to you all, over all 12? Not really, but that's how it's manifesting itself in the solution. Okay, sometimes it does, right there, really good. Other times really bad. Right here corresponds to this, this region right here. And you can see what it's doing. It's like sometimes saying it's, oh no, someone's coming from here, negative. Or sometimes it's coming from here, depending on the solution. The actual right answer is when it's right there, when it's from the south. 
but what, what's going on is you're right on this knife's edge. And if the polar fields are too strong or too weak in your solution or in your map, it'll push it down or push it up and it'll give you a different answer. Um, so solar, I was told during solar minimum, that's easy, the sun's not changing, there won't be any problems. That's the problem is it's, it's you're riding along this knife's edge of um, um, uh, uh, between it. And you're literally predicting solar wind coming from either the Northern hemisphere or the Southern hemisphere. It can be that different. All right, so how do you manage all this? Um, so what we do is we came, there's all sorts of ways to, to quantify, and I could give a whole lecture on this, on, on to measure how well are you doing compared to observations. Um, and things like, you can do a correlation coefficient, which is the first thing I did because I didn't know any better, but that's, there, there's all sorts of flaws with that. But what we decided to do, and this is just one way, there's fancier ways even more, um, it's called something the WSA prediction metric. And that's, I'm not creative, so that's the only name I could come up with. But uh, if you have a better, fancier name for it. But what we do is we look at over a time interval, let's say a rotation of the sun, we look at uh, in the numerator, how often do we get the polarity right? You know, you know, for its chance, you expect 50%, right? But we look at, you know, if it's 100%, then you're good. If it's zero, no matter what you do, this number is going to be zero. And, and what it is, it's a two, it's a, a sort of a, a, a it's two filters. You have to get the polarity right, of the, and you have to get the speed right. And the, the denominator is a, a RMS residual, like how close are you to observations? And so you want the top to be one, you want the bottom to be zero to have, you know, this is basketball, high scores is good, it's not golf. And so um, what, what happens is uh, we use this as a measure of our performance. And here's an example. We take maps from ADAPT from, for different days. So here's 12 different realizations, and this is the score. So one is what you expect by chance. Anything above one is good or better rather. And you can see there's quite a bit of spread in the performance. And then there's really a period where we do really badly. And there's a period where it's really good. So this, these are, every one of these dots corresponds to an input map. And uh, so just look, I'll show you the worst case and the best case. And you can see on the left is the worst case, almost not better than chance. Um, and maybe we could just focus on this, the speed, but here is the uh, speed. And you see, we missed this, we missed that. Um, Ed only has a score of 1.1, but here we've actually captured the structure quite well. And even the polarity, this is um, data that's not operational. So the, the up and down is because it's the ops, there's, uh, op, there's observational gaps every six hours. Um, it's actually good because when you deal with real-time data, there, there, data like that can be gappy. And so that was comforting me. At first I said, oh, I should fix that. But then I thought, this is good because you know in the real world, you face um, obstacles like that. But this is still showing that even with this gappy data, you know, you can see the gaps right here in the solar wind, it's still distinguishing between the two solutions pretty well. So this is one of the tools we developed to help um, operators. And if you're doing research, just which is input map should I use to do my modeling? Another thing we do is, um, is we look at coronal holes. Okay, so we're just beginning to, we're not alone. Just people have been doing, are doing this. But this is a map of the sun, a map of the sun. And it's a composite of three spacecraft, stereo A, which was on one side of the sun, stereo B, which is another side, and then the Solar Dynamic Observatory, which is at, in, in orbit around Earth. And it's, it's um, assembled together. And you can see the coronal holes right here. And then here's this model solution. And you know, if you're a modeler, you're like, well, that's pretty good. There's a hole here, there's a hole here. And you like, you know, this kind of matches that. And it's like, not too bad. And then you overlay, and it's like, oh, you know, <laughs> you know, and it's like, this is, I always joke, this is when you begin making excuses. It's like, oh, we don't know what's going on, on the far side of the sun. And, you know, blah, da, 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 da. Um, but what you really want in a serious thing is, what ADAPT does is actually, or just any ensemble model, it doesn't have to be ADAPT. What you want is an ensemble of solutions because the, the tendency was for people like me, it's like, well, the, op, the data have to be right. And of course the observers laugh, you know, because it's really hard. Uh, Jaime here knows how hard it is to identify coronal holes in these kind of data. He actually does research on that and it's not trivial. Uh, and so there's uncertainty in the, the, the green data here, or the EUV data. 
the model actually creates different solutions. And really what you want is, you want to know the uncertainty in the data um, and the model. And so the left here is actually, bottom left is a, another student of mine who's actually uh, created um, different, uh, different uh, you know, outlines of the, the green, uh, these EUV data and created a map that includes um, um, uncertainties that the gray regions are. And then what you want to do is then compare it to a model with all its uncertainties. So the, the bottom right is an average of the model, the bottom left is average of, of the data. And that's what you want to compare. And so there's all sorts of, of course, like how do you measure, this, this is actually hard. And so I'm gonna, I'm, I'm telling you a very simplistic thing, but this is uh, trying to um, quantify how well you're doing. People oftentimes run to something called the Jacquard similarity metric. It's, it's just the intersection of the two observations and data over the union. And if you think about it, you know, that makes sense. But what's bad is what happens when, what if you, the data show the chronos like that and the model showing the chronos like that, but they're offset. You know, the, the model that this score will say horrible, but you're actually getting the, the, the whole right. And so, you know, there's some questions about what do you do? Um, but there's a, you can using this, you can see there's a way of scoring this and indicating when you're doing better and worse and so forth. And I won't go too much into this, but uh, Drew Leisner and his advisor, Zhi Zhang, and people at New Mexico State are, are working on this, along with uh, Jaime soon, stuff like this too. Okay, another thing we're doing is uh, we're, uh, another thing we could do is we can look at the coronal magnetic field. And so, this is an eclipse photograph, just to, for demonstration purposes. And this, the, again, this is an, a, an eclipse. And so what you're doing is seeing the, that black region is the moon blocking the sun, and the white light uh, is uh, light is scattering off electrons, and you can you can see what seems like magnetic field lines. And what you can do from there is you can then segment, or you can you know segment those magnetic field lines or those lethal structures, and um, and then compare it to a model and quantify how well am I matching this? I mean, the, the reality is that when you get an active region on the far side, it actually can change the shapes of these, what are called streamers, right? You know, this, these structures right here, you can move them around. So this could help us if, if there's an active region on the far side we don't know about, it could tell us like when we're not matching, maybe, maybe there's an active region on there. And I guess one thing I didn't tell you is, there's ways to see on the far side of the sun, you can use helioseismology, which is just like regular, you know, the, uh, seismology here on earth where there's an earthquake and you can, and waves travel through the earth and you can locate it. They can do the same thing on the sun. And that they're doing that right now. Um, they can identify where the active region is. They can identify even the field strength and the size, but they can't do sign yet. So that's, that's one of the conundrums is we have to get the sign of the far side as well. But that's something that's just beginning to working towards an operational capability is to include far side. Here's just an example where here are data on the left and here's a model on the left. And uh, my um, colleague, uh, Shayla Jones at Goddard uh, has this uh, metric to identify, basically it's just, you know, is the magnetic fields point this way? Maybe the, the, the solution points that way. Like the, how much of a difference in angle are there? If it's 45 degrees, that's what you expect by chance. So you want to be less than 45. Um, and it turns out actually, well, and here you go. Um, so this is just an example where we, we use the WSA PM metric. This is just, we did a, we looked at solar wind data, but then um, in, in Shayla's world, smaller is better. So I had to take one over Jay. So, um, or she had to, um, but what happens is you can see the model performance actually kind of tracks each other. So it's promising that this method can work. Um, but again, it's, it's like, look at the chrono field, look at the model, compare the models, how well are they matching in structure? Uh, one, one of my colleagues at Goddard and his student has actually taken just a model solution, um, basically put it into another model, make it simulate a white light data, segmented it and said, how well are, this, are these segmentations matching the model? It actually does way better than I expected. Uh, it's way better than chance and the, the differences on average is only about 13 degrees. So they're doing, this, this method seems to be pretty reliable, uh, pretty good. Okay, 
and I think I'm kind of almost close right on time here. Um, let me just say another tool that we've developed is um, one of the things that uh, the Parker Solar Probe, you know about that, that's a spacecraft that's getting closer, you know, gets like, and, and it keeps getting closer and closer to the sun. And the closest part, of, if, if the distance from the earth to the sun was 100 yards, it's gonna get to the three yard line. Okay, so it's gonna be in the sun prone and sighting. And it, it's every, every pass, every perihelion, it gets closer. But one of the things they wanna know, Solar Orbiter also wants to know, is they wanna know, we're seeing data at a spacecraft. We see the plasma and so forth at the spacecraft. Where on the sun did it come from? And of course, you know, there's all, I just explained all the things that can go wrong with this. And so what we've done is we actually put in hundreds of input maps and we trace these field lines back to the spacecraft and we create a probability map of where the solar wind is coming from. So here's an example of a tool we've developed. You can actually look at this in the lab. Um, uh, it's right now, it's working for, for Earth. This is for Solar Orbiter, but uh, this is the magnetic field. And it's fuzzy because this is like hundreds of maps put together. The green areas are the coronal holes to get average. So the, 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 the faint green you see means there's just, we're less confident, the darker green, the more confident. These uh, sky blue regions are, are contours. And right here, what you're seeing is all within this blue contour, the, all the solutions of these hundreds of solutions, 94% lie within here. So this tells observers where to point. You know, now maybe wrong, but at least, you know, it's not one, just one answer. What, what happened was during the 2020 encounter for PSP, one of the models was saying, look at the north, and the other model was saying, look at the south. So we thought, well, if we did this, we could at least give them a probability based on the modeling of, you know, maybe enhancing their chance of where it's coming from. You see, there's a 1% chance right here, but then we can let it evolve. And you can see how it changes. So there's three different locations. Now it's 98%, 100% confident right there. And I, I guess that's the length of the movie, but you can see how it changes. And it's actually fun to watch it over like a, a rotation. And this is actually, this, this case is for Solar Orbiter. So let me wrap up. I, I guess I stopped it. We can let it go. Let's see if it, maybe it's just repeats. So let me just wrap up. And uh, um, I don't think we're alone in this area, but modeling uh, the Corona and Solar Wind is very challenging. I, I guess that's why we do what we do. Um, um, uh, the coronal and solar wind models are highly dependent on magnetic field observations. Um, th there's a lot of uncertainties. I didn't even get into all of them. That things, things about, um, you know, we only see the line of sight, so we have to make assumptions to get the radial part uh, and things like the poles that I discussed in more detail and the far side and so forth. Uh, so using ensemble maps of the magnetic field actually helps represent the uncertainty. Uh, but one of the, <laughs> now we're finding, is, you know, are we actually creating the proper ensemble? You know, what's the best way to do that? That's something that we're exploring now. Um, and then what I discussed was different ways of, of quantitative constraining and validating coronal and solar wind models. Uh, like the WCAP metric, we're gonna make that. So the, um, I just had a discussion with the, one of the NOAA people that they can start using those numbers to provide the forecasters, which input map to, to use. So when they do their, their CME modeling, maybe they have a better chance of getting the, the arrival time of the CME more accurate. You've got to get the background of the solar wind accurate, uh, right. You got to get the background of solar wind right um, because the CME is plow through it. And if you're wrong, you can, uh, uh, you can get a different answer. It's like a hurricane. When a hurricane goes through, it depends on what you are flowing through if the water's hot or cold as to how intense the storm is going to be. And even maybe when it arrives, but certainly that's true with um, CMEs. So we're using spacecraft observation, coronal holes, and coronal structure and topology. If you have any other ideas, let me know, because we, we, you know, certainly this isn't the only ideas. And it's really important to know both modeling and observational uncertainties, uh, to, because that's critical con for constraining models. And that's, I think, about 50 minutes. So I think we're... Questions. This is our chance to yeah. get speaker. Okay. All right. Uh, who's got a question? 
Yeah, sorry. Uh, for validation, um, uh, Justina Sokol, um, she used uh, um, um, a, like electron scintillation of the solar wind and then um, used uh, like spherical harmonics to create 3D maps of the solar wind. I don't know if you maybe, but it, it has its own error as well, but right. it would be a good, um, good way to try and uh, validate like the global output of the model? Yeah, I mean, are you talking about IPS uh, in planetary simulation? Yes. Yeah. So actually, it, it's funny you mentioned it because we, we were actually talking some like we want those maps because yeah. uh, we uh, want it. What we want to do is actually take the WSA solution and and um, uh, and the interplanetary, they have uncertainties, like you said, but I think together they'll you'll be stronger yeah. and you can correct. So yeah, that's that's exactly what we're thinking about doing. Good suggestion. Good point. Can I, can I follow up another? Sure. Um, is there any uh, is there any upcoming missions uh, that are dealing with the need for global synoptic maps? Do that, like is Punch or Heliosworm, any of them have uh, the capabilities of doing a constellation that are, are making it? And if not, are um, are we able to push for that? Like getting the instrumentation that you need to to create the the best maps. Punch does not. Um... Sometimes um, these missions are limited, and so they, you know, if they're, they have a certain science focus, they may not include it. But everyone now recognizes how important it is. And, and unfortunately, the stereo spacecraft, if, I mean, this is my opinion, but I think I'm not alone. It's, it's like, I wish they would have put magnetographs on, this, on them. I mean, it really, I think, I think would, it would have advanced this, like, uh, you know, far, far in time. I, and I, what I what I told the colleague at one of the, the conferences, uh, we were joking. It's just uh, I'm sort of embellishing here, but they're they're like, why did you miss that CME arrival time? It's like, well, because the WC model stinks. And then I said, you know, I, I said, no, 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 your your CME specification thing stinks. But I said, think about it really though. If if you have a perfect model with all the physics of the Crone and everything, right? All the physics, everything, and you have the wrong input data, you're still going to get the wrong answer, right? So we really need those data. So there's there's a recognition recognition in the community of uh, including um, uh, magnetographs. And so the Europeans are putting a, a spacecraft called Vigil, which is going to be in the L5 orbit. That's going to have a magnetograph. And there's been missions like um, uh, Solaris that it, it, it didn't win, but they 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 were going to go over the poles and and they would include a magnetograph. And I think a lot of missions now are talking about putting magnetographs on it. So there's a clear, um, I think there's a recognition now of the need of that. Um, one of the things I was just the what, what what I did go to another meeting, American Meteorological Society, and Noah went up and said, "Oh, we're going to put a new coronagraph on because ours is from 1995 or something like that, uh, Soho." And um, I think stood up and said, "Why, why didn't you put a? Aren't you going to put a magnetic ground there?" And they, "Well, we have this ground-based system called Gong, which is I th but the problem with this Gong's like end of life, and so it." There's a disconnect too. So there's really a um, we're trying to pu push to have both ground and space-based capabilities. You mentioned that the the current free assumption, like in the Corona, is actually not that bad of a an assumption. And also, is there any like plan to maybe move away from current free like PFSS oh. model for the like, the base? Um, where's John McLean? <laughs> there, there, there's, a, there's advanced models, both like at Predictive Science, as an example, or at Michigan, who have advanced MHD models that don't make any of the assumptions. They're, you know, and so they're, they're, they're the cutting edge current research. The problem with it is, is again, the boundary conditions. And also they're, you know, that's one of the, that's one advantage of WC, I'm not trying to promote it, but it, we can run and get pretty good solutions, pretty okay solutions. And narrow down the best input maps, and um, but the thing with the, and we can do like thousands, but you know for them they need much more time to run. But we're really on the precipice of um, starting to use these. Um, I think like in the next ten years we'll probably be moving towards from an, an operational sense. I, I think I said that ten years ago though. But anyway, but yeah, there's way more advanced models. The reason it's not such a bad assumption is 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 essentially um, you know since it is so highly conducting, if there are currents, they tend to settle out pretty quickly and and the the um the potential field solution is a minimum energy solution 
So that's the, on, on a large scale, it kind of, you know, everything tries to go to minimum energy. And so like if you're looking down an active region, don't believe anything that a potential fill model tells you. But on the large scale, it mostly does okay. Um, hi. So we've been looking at validating mostly the solar wind speed profiles. Are we also looking at validating the ambient magnetic field profiles coming out from these models? Yeah, well, I, I guess I downplayed it. We, we look at the polarity, the magnetic field polarity, um, so in and out. So we do look at the magnetic field. Um, one of the problems is, uh, so we do do that. Okay, so in fact, that WCPM actually, you have to get the you have to get the polarity right, and you have the speed right. I'll, I'll go in a little bit more detail. One of the things is the the polarity part. Um, it's not unusual to get the right speed, but then from the wrong coronal hole, you actually get the wrong polarity. That's why I decided wait, let's have a little bit more stringent criteria. And it just turns out if you're near the boundary of a coronal hole, you're going to get slow wind. And so sometimes it'll be about right, but it's like completely wrong region. So I wanted that criteria. Now um, the potential there's a problem that the amount of magnetic field that comes out from the sun, there's a little bit of a disconnect in what the models predict and what the um, observations show. I, I have a bias, I think maybe I know where that's happening, but that's another lecture. Um, but the, uh, uh, yeah, you can look at that too. Um, and, uh, um, but we look at polarity. Okay, thank you. Questions? Yep. Morning. Hi. So I'm not a modeler, but I'm at Michigan and I've seen how computationally expensive models can be and running them on supercomputers and everything. So I'm just curious what it takes to make a model and then make it operational for space weather predictions. Um, it's, it's funny because, um, so th this, this model's pretty simple and so forth, but there, um, one of the problems is, is that you just, you can't have anything break. So there's everything like, I want to go and see, you know, does this observatory have data? You know, yes. Okay. Now I got to check the data. Is there anything corrupted with it? Is it got a gap in it and so forth? You know, or it like, I couldn't connect. Should I go back and try and connect and get it? Then it's like, you know, run the model. Then, you know, uh, you know, check the, you know, check to make sure it's okay. Then run it and make sure the solution converges. We, WSA ran for three years in operation before it broke. So that was actually apparently really good. Uh, but it got stuck in an infinite loop trying to trace a fill line. And so that was an easy fix. But it's stupid stuff like that happens, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, no. It's, it's, I, like, it's like, I, I have all sorts of comments about that. Or it's smart. Like, but um, no, just they, they, we got a call and so forth. But it really, we spent so much time fail safing. You know, I mean, this program and I were, were like, okay, what example was, during uh, this, maybe a little bit before your time, but the the uh, Y two K thing during the year we timed it. So in in the nineteen nineties and before everything was in two year intervals, ninety eight, and then we were switching over to to two thousand, and so everyone was like, oh, you know, all the all the programs are going to break because you know we we were using two digits and and it's not going to understand zero zero, and so like I actually put into WSA a fix so that it knew what zero zero meant. But it turned out the observatory two days before fixed their Y2K problem. So it produced four digits. So then I had introduced a Y2K problem trying to fix a Y2K problem. So, um, but then it's like, you know, it's got to generate output, you know, and, and, and then, you know, it's got to post everything and so forth. And so it's just one of those things, there's just the amount of things that can go wrong, silly stuff. Now it's just the real world. I mean, this, you know, when you do Amazon, they've thought through all these things. Um, the, but just all the things that, you know, you know, did it, can, can you connect? Why can't you, okay, stop, don't run this. Is there a solution? Okay, don't run a bad solution, so forth, you know, and uh, other things that can just cause it to break. And so it's a surprising amount of time just making sure it doesn't break, you know, that it's robust. That's, that's really challenging. Hello, uh, my question is, uh, like as a follow-up question about time for fires in the solar wind, which parameter like in the solar wind is most challenging to like predict? Is it the solar wind speed or? Well, you know what's challenging about it is, um, 
I, I wish I, I, I should have saved some slides. I could actually pull, I, I mean, I, I won't do it right now. But what happens is it could turn out, I was talking about correlation coefficient, and it can turn out that, you know, you, you, your model produces what is called a high speed stream. So it's sort of like slow in and an abrupt rise and then tailing off, right? And then it could turn out that the observations also show that, but it turns out your model's like a day or two off. When you do a correlation coefficient, it just kills, you do horrible. You do absolutely horrible because of the offset. And so there's some people are using things called dynamic time warping now that, that actually will adjust for that and see like how well does your profile work and so forth. Um, but that'll kill you. I also had a thing where the model was predicting slow wind, but it was like, it's like a sine wave. And it was, it was all about 350 to 400. And it was like this, but it turned out the observations were out of phase, but about 350 to four. And it was like at an anti-correlation. But if a forecaster looked at it, what it was telling it was slow wind. But you know, just mathematically, it was producing anti-correlation. So you know, and it's sort of like, what's the right way to do this? That's tricky, really tricky. So we're going to go into Mark, who's going to talk about the. Um, sorry, Dan. Sorry, I'm looking at Mark. Dan, <laughs> he's going to talk. Dan's good. I know. Oh, you. Yeah, we have a break. My bad. Yeah. I'm so sorry. We get breaks. We get breaks. I totally missed the break. We're going to have a 10 minute break. Um, yeah, we can still do 10 minutes. We're going to do a 10 minute break. And then Dan will talk <laughs> about um, how some of these kind of inputs go into magnetospheric models. Um, and then at the end, as, as you guys remember, we're going to have another bit of time that you guys can ask additional questions from either one of these guys. Um, so uh, while you're on your 10 minute break that I almost robbed you of, uh, please think about um, what you've heard and interesting questions you might ask later. 12 after. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. You, I didn't, I, they get breaks? I know. What's, what's up with that? They never got breaks. Nice job. Thanks. Was it a rate? Yeah, no, it's great. You stopped there. Just going into like, you know, eight minutes. Now we got, you know, 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, oh, you started in like the very short. You don't need to. <laughs> no, it's just like, oh, yeah, that's why having a just get like no prediction works just as well. <laughs> I know. Sorry, Hi, Nick Mitchell. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Nice. Nice. Yeah, back in the past, we have went to and uh, they're, 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 they're moving, generating good speed. So, mm -hmm. uh, they're like, yeah. Well, if uh, you have any questions or want to chat more, let me know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Nick. Oh, yeah, and Jack. And we're not too far away from each other. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, come here, come along. Right. It's just a, it's a, it's a coupling of two types of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, well, we actually could, we could we keep sliding the screens in. We, we we actually do updated maps where we keep we keep adding these data. So the, the, the data is updated updated with the map. That's why we use the transform model because what we do is we simulate and then we evolve everything up to map, and then we simulate data and then evolve. So we try to. We, we can't predict what's on the far side of the thing, but otherwise we're trying to, we're actually trying to do that with synchronic or instantaneous, where we uh, will assimilate and then the model uh, will transport the code, transport all the fields to a new time, but they're all simultaneous. Yeah, yeah. So it just essentially what it does is we'll take a snapshot, add data, and then we, we, we evolve that, that set of data to a new time, mm -hmm. and new data evolves, add it, evolve oh, it, yeah. add it, yeah. So, so it, it helps some, but it's, it, it, we can't predict emergence, and so that's one of the challenges. And the poles are very uncertain, and we can't really predict that either. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, no, Well, they, they mostly, uh, on average, they match, but it's just that there's offsets and everything. And so, it's, um, and so your question is, like, how do we make it out of it? Yeah, how do we make it? Because it doesn't match the material. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so now you need to get sand digs on the hole. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but potentially the second chain is Yeah, good. right. Well that's what we're sort of hoping. Um and, and we're trying to use that mm -hmm. as a global bound as a global measure of how well the models are matching. And it on, it works I I can, I'm saying this based on some yeah. work we're doing. On average it works pretty well. Like the matches that mm -hmm. like the average error mm -hmm. average error. But for locations and the exact structure, you can see they can be very different. Yeah. So there's some other like a large scale. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, is there any other questions? Oh, uh, no. I think we're done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, and access. Um, usually, what we actually we were access. We start making it public, but usually, if you have a collaboration with someone, or if you have a map, you have no. It depends on what you want. Do you want to actually use the model? And where? But I mean, the the only thing right now I have to to make it open source. I, um, I like if it goes out of the country, I might get in trouble. But yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Like what, what is solution there? Okay. Yeah. I wonder. Let me let me look in. We're trying to make it open source, and we'd like to actually make it accessible to virtually anyone. Who wants to. Anyone wants to do that. My problem is that there's there's um, releasing code internationally is a currently problem. Um, but NASA is encouraging us to make these data public. So we I did have to go through the paperwork to get approval to make it. But I'm, I'm actually would be very happy to let people use the code personally. Um, do you have a code or anything to make it a hard? Um, you're, are you a grad student or? Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's like, um, are, are you, um, the, the, my problem is usually I'll let people do rough use it. I, I, I need to get approval to let people help. But I don't have a problem with it personally because I would like to. But um, I have to like get approval to do that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I actually have a, I have a chart. That would be a nice thing to provide. I'm, I'm we're getting funding to support the community more than I can, the broad community. So, um, I guess if we're for the U.S. Air Force, then giving anything away is just makes me just freak out on that. Um, 
Actually, um, the, the venue build data, there's Stanford's actually using the machine learning to, to look at the human seismology part, and they're using that to, to get the part. So, yes, people are using machine learning and AI to, to, to improve the regional boundary. So one minute warning, we're going to get started. <laughs> yeah. I gave them a two minute, nobody's coming. Now a 30 second warning. <laughs> Okay, everyone, uh, welcome back. And uh, for the second lecture of today, we have uh, Dan Welling. Uh, you hopefully notice the theme of today's lectures are the different models of uh, the different areas. And so Dan, please introduce yourself and take it away. time ago deploying and maintaining mag magnetometers on the Greenlandic ice cap. And I'll never forget my first day of grad school that I, I had an experience that was common then and I hope less common now. My advisor first day, okay, what do you need me to do? And he says, I need you to make this plot and this plot. Like, Great, how do we do that? He goes, well, most people use IDL. And if you don't know what IDL is, it's a language that old people know. Uh, <laughs> I said, great, well, how do I use IDL? And he goes, well, I guess you're gonna have to learn and walked away and I was just like, so I spent that, that first summer in grad school teaching myself how to program with a nose and an IDL book, just putting things together. And I remember that first basic plot, I was so damn proud of. And I showed it to my advisor and he was like, yeah, this doesn't show us anything. And I'm just like, it exists, man, you know? But I, I, I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed programming a lot. So at some point in my, my grad school, I switched from um, uh, flying to the Greenlandic ice cap to running um, the space weather modeling framework. And since then, I've been to a number of places, Los Alamos, back at Michigan, University of Texas Arlington, back at Michigan, and I don't like it there, I said, I guess. Uh, doing a lot of different the magnetosphere modeling with the space weather modeling framework, looking at the ring current, looking at ionospheric outflow, um, uh, doing a lot of space weather uh, research and space weather uh, research to operations, which is really fantastic. And the other story I'll quickly tell that I, was a, a formative moment for me in my career was as a grad student, I was trying to understand plasma sheet dynamics in VATS RS. And one of the things I, I wanted to figure out was like, okay, how is this plasma even getting here? So I was tracing streamlines. And my deeply held belief is that those streamlines were eventually going to connect to the solar array. And it did not matter what I did, those streamlines would go to the inner boundary. And I was convinced that I was either running the model wrong or something was wrong. And I worked on this for months. And it wasn't until I, I you know, I was showing this to Aaron Ridley out of pure frustration. He goes, well, maybe that's not wrong. The ionosphere provides plasma to the, the magnetosphere. And it was, for me, that was just like such a, oh my God, I'm doing science moment for me. Cause I, I had this, this notion that I, I would not let go of it had to be right. And it was just like, oh my gosh, pay attention, man. You know, 
and uh, in, in learning to be flexible on my understanding of the system and, and letting the evidence lead me a little better. So with that, let's talk about inputs to magnetosphere models. And this is a deceivingly big topic, and I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground, but let's start with some definitions. Uh, there's a slight lag on here because of Zoom, and that's going to do my head in all day. So when, I, when I'm talking about models, I don't just mean like MHD or something like that, but I want to speak very broadly, right? They can be first principles based or regression based, machine learning and things like that. I have my own biases. So today we're really going to be focusing on first principles based models, but please abstract what I'm saying the best you can. Uh, when I talk about magnetosphere models, I mean any model of the magnetosphere or its parts. And we're going to start with the plasma sphere because the plasma sphere is secretly really fun. Uh, and when I mean model inputs, I don't just mean solar wind conditions. I mean anything that you need to get that code to run. And then finally, just as a point of reference, uh, when it comes to how I, I wrote this, I'm really trying to deliver this as for people who are more model users, people who are running the code at CCMC or have a bunch of model results dumped in their lap, not you know developers or power users who are like, well, let me just recompile on here real quick. And oh, there we go. So it's, it's kind of that level. In 50 minutes or less than that, because I talk a lot, I hope that you will, your ability to do the following things will improve. First of all, identify inputs required for a given magnetosphere model. Two, recognize how impacts, how inputs can impact a numerical simulation, especially in surprising ways. And then three, given research goals in the context of what you're trying to do, critically assess, uh, <laughs> assess the strengths and weaknesses of a set of model inputs used for that study, right? Because the, the conclusions of this really depends on the context of what you're trying to do. Did I go backwards? That's fantastic. Okay. I wonder if it's slow on mic. Nope, it's just Zoom. Fantastic. Okay. So what do I mean by inputs? Inputs are anything you need to run your model, including initial conditions, including boundary conditions, um, source and loss terms, variables not explicitly solved by the numerical scheme. You might have five equations and six unknowns. That means information about that last variable has to come from somewhere. That's an input to your model. Um, and values used to create regression-based models. So if you're a machine learning person, this would be your features as opposed to your labels. And that's a really important thing to consider, and we'll touch on that today. Uh, there's a whole discussion to be had about the configuration and the parameter set of the numerical model you're using. Um, and this can be spatial grid, solver order, time se stepping scheme. If you pull open the manual for the space weather modeling framework, you're going to find, what are you up to, 200 pages? Do I have any SWMF friends in here? Thank you. <laughs> and you've, of course, pulled open the manual, right? But you, you know it's, it's, it's huge, and you can, you know, without changing solar wind inputs, make a very unique simulation. Um, this is a huge topic. It could require its own deep dive. I ask just that you keep that in mind when you're working on things, especially if you are storing data from a publication, store the parameter space, the, the input you used with that so it's easier to read. And you'll see this kind of impact some things today. Cool. So with that, let's do a case study. We're going to look at the DGCPM or the Dynamic Global Core Plasma Sphere Model or for people who are older, the Dennis Gallagher Core Plasma Model because that's who developed it. Um, so this is a, a time dynamic model of the plasma sphere and this uh, zoom frame rated movie is showing that in action. We're looking at the equatorial plane of the magnetosphere, the day side on the top, midnight on the bottom, and the contour is... Uh, cold electron density. So this is like EV, sub-EV kind of plasma. 
These lines here, the dashed and straight lines, are equipotential lines. This is E cross B advecting plasma. So it's going to follow equipotential lines. And that orange line is our separatrix. It is the division between closed drift paths. So this stuff's just going to be co-rotating with the Earth. And open drift paths, plasma here is free to escape out the dayside magnetopause. OK, DGCPM is solving this equation. It is a continuity equation for big N, flux tube content, the number of electrons per flux tube in the magnetosphere as a function of local time or as the muthal position around the Earth, L shell or radial distance from the Earth, and time. And we saw the whole thing evolve. And the variables in this equation are our flux tube content, big N, our perpendicular velocity, our velocity perpendicular to the magnetic field. This is our E cross B drift. And then on the right side, we are going to be refilling the plasma sphere from escaping ions from the magnetosphere via uh, from the ionosphere uh, through a simple source transfer. Um, we're solving using a second order upwind scheme with super B limiter. It assumes a dipole field and the ionosphere is refilling the flux tubes given the source term. So my question to you, and feel free to like raise your hand and talk, I'm an interactive person, is what are the inputs to this model? Who's got, who's got thoughts? Alex, you have thoughts. Yes, our source term here, absolutely. Magnetic field, we're, we're cheating because magnetic field, we assume the dipole. You're absolutely right, but it's, it's baked in. That one's really easy. Electric potential is all baked in to our U there. With, yep. And I'm going to go ahead and push forward. So if we go back to my previous slide and think about the different inputs, we have initial conditions. Before we start, we need to specify our density at all local times in L shells, we need to define the starting point. Our boundary conditions for this run are actually pretty simple. It's, it's less of an input because it's, it's not something we're going to change necessarily. The outer boundary is lossy. Anything that hits the outer boundary is gone. And we just have Neumann on, uh, inner boundary conditions. So there's no uh, spatial uh, gradient across the inner boundary. Our source and loss term, our refilling rate is in this code set by a study by Carpenter and Anderson that told us what the density would be for a saturated plasma sphere and how long it takes to get there. And from there, we, we do some back of the envelope math to tack that in there. We could replace this and get a very different solution. And then the big one that, that you two pointed out is getting that perpendicular velocity. And this was a, a bit of a Sophie's choice of content where I could go on a long rant about the selection of ionospheric potential models in a lot of different contexts and have a two hour talk or uh, skip it and have a talk that's, that's less <laughs> than the time I needed. Um, but there are a lot of choices here. For this model, in this run specifically, we're using Bolland Stern electric field. This is a, a simple, KP based electric, uh, electric potential model to set our perpendicular velocity. And so we're kicking the can down the road. Instead of doing E and B, we're just doing, oh, perpendicular velocity as a function of KP using Wallenstern. We could use Weimer, we could use results from a global coupled MHD model, um, and those would drastically change our results here. And so that's an important input. Uh, input data for relationships, we don't have them. So I want to explore boundary conditions a little bit more, or excuse me, initial conditions. And so what we're going to try is running DGCPM for a super simple synthetic storm. Um, and because our really critical input here is the uh, perpendicular velocity, we're going to define our storm using KP index. We're going to do 10 hours quiet, KP1 minus. 24 hours uh, elevated at six plus, and then back to quiet time. This is going to change what our electric field looks like from the Wallen Stern model and change the convection paths. We're going to simulate this extremely basic storm two ways. Once, there we go. Uh, 
once using the baked in inner boundary conditions, if you just ran DGCPM without changing the setup. And this is a, a saturated plasma sphere for KP, I think of, of like two or three. So it really kind of cuts off to make this teardrop shape. And over here, we're going to do an initial condition where we're just going to saturate the whole thing. Which one is right? Anybody have any thoughts about what one's right? The left? We have a vote for the left. Who says left? My right. Who says left? You're all winners. It doesn't matter. The, the, right, the real question is it depends on the conditions you're trying to simulate. This side represents a situation where we would have like a week of extremely quiet solar wind conditions with predominantly northward IMF and things could just saturate at all L shells. We've observed this before, it happens. And this would be kind of like a more typical quiet time plasma sphere. We've had some activity, KP goes up and down and you get kind of this background shape and that happens too. So it's not that either one is right or wrong, but it depends on the context of what you're trying to achieve. So let's run these and watch what happens. And this is gonna be fantastic with uh, Zoom, but we'll do our best, we'll do our best. So we're gonna get going and I'm gonna pause it. And oops, I'm gonna attempt to pause it. And I'm gonna get in a fight with PowerPoint. And immediately we see drastic differences in our simulation results, right? We have a ton of material on open drift paths. So we get this day side surge of a plasma sphere plume. And we just have some co-rotation here with this little bit forming this, this uh, long tail on our plume. And we're gonna let this keep going. And when the storm starts, our separatrix moves in. And you see, I might back it up like two frames. The initial response to the storm is different. We see the residual plume that had been wrapped around now uh, contributing more to the dusk side of noon. We have a very centralized plume for this initial condition, but we have a much broader plume at a broader range of uh, local times with the saturated condition. Now, interestingly, we let this keep going and what happens, the two simulations converge, right? As the storm progresses and as we go back to quiet time, these two runs, you'd have an impossible time trying to differentiate between which one was which. And the reason for that goes back to this idea of the magnetosphere ionosphere system being a strongly driven system, right? This is how we're different than atmospheric people who really worry about initial conditions and inertia in the system. We just let the solar wind blow things out. Uh, but you have to, you know, this means that our initial conditions have a time limited, excuse me, uh, have a time limited impact on results, but it's critical for you to recognize the different time scales of different systems. Ionospheric electrodynamics can respond in minutes. The ring current, the plasma sphere, hours to days. And so you just want to know the time scale of interest to you and design your numerical experiment to uh, properly account for that. Okay. Uh, in general, how do I have a white screen? Oh, I'm cutting off the top of my screen. That's interesting. Just, I love Zoom. <laughs> Thank you so much. The IT people are fantastic. I seriously appreciate you. Um, building initial conditions and magnetosphere models. There, so this is kind of how we do it for a lot of different models. In terms of global MHD, there are a couple of, of interesting ways to do it. Uh, in Bats R Us, we employ a steady state mode. Our initial condition in the magnetosphere is uniform density, dipole magnetic field, zero flow everywhere. Wrong, right? So what do we do? We set the upstream boundary conditions to be the solar wind conditions corresponding to the start of our run. And then we run the code, we let it iterate with local time stepping, but we don't increment the time variable. So it just spins until we achieve a pseudo steady state that is, we hope is representative of our initial condition that we wish to start with at the beginning of the run. For our LFM slash Gamera people, they use a, a distinct but similar approach. They start with a 12 hour preconditioning simulation, keeping the solar wind density and velocity constant, but they'll let their 
IMF go north, south, north to kind of churn things up and get things going and make a more realistic starting point. Intermagnetosphere models, ring current, radiation, but plasma sphere models typically draw quiet time conditions from different empirical relationships or statistical models based on observations because there's just a lot of information there. Uh, and thermosphere models like GITM, where time scales can be very long and that initial condition can linger for a while, will typically run two or more days of simulation before they get to the, the quote, quote, fun part. Okay, so let's move on to our, our next case study, and this is the big one, which is global MHD. And we, hopefully we all know global MHD now, it's, or are aware of it, it's fun. Um, we're solving continuity of a, uh, mass, momentum, and energy, and tying the magnetic field to velocity through the induction equation. We have eight state variables, two scalar variables, mass density and pressure, and two vector quantities, three components of velocity and three components of magnetic field. There are a lot of implementations for this, a lot of numerical solvers. There's just a bunch. Um, what are the inputs to this model? Yeah, all of these variables. <laughs> exactly, right? All of our state variables. There's a hand over here. The solar wind driving, exactly. And that's how we get these at the inner of uh, the upstream boundary. Any other thoughts before I switch frames? Uh, no, that's exactly right. We do have initial conditions, which I've already covered. Uh, boundary conditions, it's all about setting those eight state variables at the upstream boundary. I want you to imagine this square as a six sided box. The upstream boundary is the really important one because things are flowing in. The sides and the downstream boundary, less and far less important. Um, we also have inner boundary conditions. We need to be setting all of those variables at the inner boundary. And that's critical. For ideal MHD, we're not going to consider source and loss terms right now, at least not for typical Earth simulation. So all this is zero. And then when it comes to variables not solved for and input data relationships, if we're limiting ourselves, to ideal MHD back from like 3D MHD in the 80s before we had an ionosphere. Uh, none, but that's gonna change when we start coupling things and it's gonna get crazy. Cool. So let's talk about the elephant in the room when it comes to running MHD models, which is the upstream boundary conditions, which is essentially the process of taking some solar wind variables to cover all eight state variables and applying them to the upstream boundary of our MHD box. The overwhelming approach for doing this is to set the scalar or the vector values at one instant uniformly across that plane. If you have an inclined shock coming in, if your earth is here and it's coming in, that entire inner upstream boundary condition changes at once. It doesn't propagate across. There are some codes that have settings to address this, but the default thing you should assume is that the inner upstream boundary conditions change instantaneously, even if you have an inclined uh, solar wind coming in. That's scary. <laughs> the more you learn about codes, the more scared you get. It's amazing. Um, obtaining upstream boundaries seems like a simple process, but there's actually a ton of pitfalls. So I want to spend a little bit of time on this. In general, you start, how many people have ever like grabbed a bunch of solar wind variables to run a global model? Got a couple people in there. Fantastic. So, you know, you kind of, you start by heading over to either CETAweb or OmniWeb to grab observations that are most likely from L1. So this is ACE and discover values. Um, CETAweb, for those who don't know, is NASA's big data repository, like all the CDF files for all their missions, all their public data. Whereas OmniWeb is a project that takes various observations of the solar wind and synthesizes it together. It processes it uniformly, does all the propagation and things like that, so you, you don't have to worry about it. It's nice, but has limitations. You might 
try to look at values away from L1 and closer to the Earth. For example, if cluster or MMS are in the solar wind just upstream of the Earth, you might grab that. Or you might, you know, what I like to call hat theorem, pull them out of hat, which is great for doing controlled experiments. And you see a lot of that, it's really important. The next thing you need to do is if those values aren't near the pow shock, you need to propagate those values to the magnetosphere. The solar wind needs to travel from the point of observation to the nose of the bow shock. You have to take care of that or to the upstream boundary of your code. Um, there are several methods for doing this. Um, simple ballistic is problematic because if you have a slow fluid parcel and a fast moving fluid parcel at a moment later, this is going to catch up and that's going to evolve. So you have to be careful and mindful of that. Um, the uh, OmniWeb uses a phase front angles and uh, minimum, var uh, minimum variance analysis to try to propagate the solar wind. You could also just use 1D MHD. Uh, Omni, I already said what Omni does. So there's different ways to approach this you need to be aware. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. Um, the next thing you need to do is to adapt the results to the MHD code you're using. Rotate it to the desired coordinate system um, and be mindful of time interpolation. Time steps for global MHD codes are typically sub-second, right? It is inching along, whereas your upstream values are more often than not one-minute values. So what happens between the time you're solving and those, that minute more often than not, your code is linearly interpolating between those two points because that is a robust way to go about things. If you have less resolution, we'll talk. There are a lot of problems here. There are a lot of tricky spots, right? Um, when you get the data, are there data gaps? What is the time resolution? Did you measure something that actually hit Earth, right? Because it's, it's not, the satellite isn't at L1, it's orbiting L1, and the solar wind isn't moving radially. It's got non-radial components. Um, is the propagation high quality? Did the values evolve between L1 and Earth? There is a whole uh, growing, group of people looking exactly at this right now, trying to understand the sources of error between those two points. Um, is the model configuration appropriate for the input data set? Now, I'll, I'll talk about that more in a second, but it is a consideration you need. Okay, look at this. It's St. Patrick's Day storm 2015. Who here has ever looked at this storm? Very popular because it was like one of the big ones when things were really boring. Um, we have the magnetic field and three components, density and earthward velocity. Everything looks great. No, uh, there are a whole bunch of data gaps here. This is one, two, three, four, five days of data. And all these spots where the lines go perfectly straight is Python's matplotlib just linearly interpolating between two points. A bunch of data gaps here. Um, this is especially problematic for ACE data, where the sweep ham instrument will shut down to protect itself uh, during extreme driving. It's also very susceptible to um, uh, contamination during active periods. So you just don't have plasma data alongside your magnetic field values. The most famous example of this is October 2003, the Halloween event. Who studied this one? Here's your solar wind drivers. We have great magnetic field. Our density and velocity are hourly values. And they are not, I, I'm trying to think, this, all of this is a mishmash between ACE, geotail, and maybe wind, I think. We have like really poor data coverage for this event. And people validate their codes using this as inputs. So that's when you see Halloween storms, res, storm results, good or bad, keep this in mind. There are mitigating strategies. Uh, do not purely rely on OmniWeb. OmniWeb is very conservative about marking data as bad and leaving data gaps. You can sometimes get more complete stuff from CETAWeb, but that leaves the propagation up to you. Um, consider multiple data sources, especially, well, was MMS or cluster or anybody upstream? Can I use that? 
um, and get to know and talk to the, the PIs for different instruments on spacecraft. I was working on a storm, there was no plasma data. I reached out to Ruth Skoog and she's like, well, sweep ham was down, but we have some housekeeping data so I can give you half hour data. I'm like, that's better than nothing. Um, so make those relationships, identify those people and don't be afraid to cold call, right? If they don't like it, they won't respond. It doesn't hurt you at all. Do these data gaps matter? Hmm, that depends on your use case. Uh, and let's talk about that specifically, do the wiggles matter, right? When we have those data gaps, we tend to interpolate over them. Uh, when we wanted to know how big of a deal this was. So this is work that's being done by my student, Sophie Greff at uh, UTA, now Michigan. She wanted to look at how much downsampling going from one minute resolution down to 60 minute resolution was gonna impact her results. Um, to do this, how many of you are familiar with the, the SWIFT CCMC validation challenge? Fantastic. Polkanen 2013 paper, over the course of four years, CCMC and SWIFT teamed up with five different model developers to see which ones could best forecast ground-based DBDT. Oh, my apologies. NOAA SWIPSI is the Space Weather Prediction Center. They are the arm of NOAA responsible for um, providing forecasts and alerts of space weather to interested customers. And CCMC is NASA's Community Coordinated Modeling Center, where you can go and run models and play with things. And they also do space weather uh, related efforts. So this was basically six real world events, six magnetometers, five codes, a set of metrics, see who could do it best and under what conditions. So Sophie repeated this with the space weather modeling framework, um, starting with the one minute data and then downsampling, downsampling, downsampling to get smoother and smoother data. She would then compare the forecast to observations, recalculate the metrics from the, the 2013 study and voila. Over here, we are looking at the BDT, our observations are the gray values, and then we have the results from the model for the one minute down to the 60 minute values. And it just gets more and more smooth, right? We're missing, here we're getting a lot of the variations down at 60 minutes, we're not getting it all. Uh, and so on and so forth. There are some peaks we still do get, but others we don't. This here is the power spectra of the magnetometer values, right? So it's the amount of power contained in the ground magnetometer signal as a function of the frequency of that power. And the black is the observed, right? We see a lot of power in the low frequency and it drops off as we get higher and higher. The blue line tends to match that reasonably well. And as we lower the time resolution of our inputs, it gets worse and worse. Does this matter to you? If you're looking at ground-based magnetometers, absolutely. If you're looking at general you know, ionospheric electrodynamics, maybe not, maybe not. Um, but we found that this structure really matters under some use cases. Our skill scores were falling monotonically as our sampling period grow, uh, grew. Um, yeah, I'm running out of time, so I gotta get shuffling here a little bit, but that's important. <laughs> One more anecdote, I would had, the opportunity to work on the project to take the space weather modeling framework from research to operations with SWIFT-C. And they were driving this code with discover data, which is up here. This is right from their web page. So this is a uh, magnetic field, density, velocity, temperature during a storm. And this is results from the SWMF. But do you see all that noise there? That was happening during quiet time too. You would have a single point in and density go from like five to 50 and then back again in, in one sample. Uh, and what this, they were feeding this naively into the SWMF and it's a problem Discover was an old satellite before it launched, right? It was in storage for years and then they launched it and so their data quality isn't where they want it to be. And this was basically creating micro storms during quiet time. Uh, and we were trying to figure out, well, how do we deal with bad data? Bad data isn't just data gaps, it's, it's the limitations of the instrumentation. So we have to be aware of that. 
Okay. Um, here's a fun one. Mark will remember this story really well, actually. I was working with, Mike Hartinger was leading a project to look at ULF waves in the magnetosphere. And we were gonna work on this with the space weather modeling framework. And our first step was to reproduce results from Seth Claude Pierre's work using LFM, where we're taking, this is density and dynamic pressure from the solar wind over a few hours, high time resolution data, right? So we plugged this into the SWMF. This is our grid configuration for the, the run. The colors are showing you what the spatial separation between points is in that region. So in the red, one eighth Earth radii, orange, one quarter, et cetera. And we get more coarse because we no one cares about, you know, 80 RE down tail, 60 RE off the, the, the sun Earth line, right? So we don't have to resolve that. And he would come back to me, Mike would come back to me. He's like, we're not getting the same results. We are not seeing ULF waves in BATS RS at all. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what's the problem here? And we worked on this for a while. And the problem is wavelength. The problem was the grid. This is a high frequency signal with a short wavelength. And our grid at the upstream boundary is only a quarter Earth radii. So we are, we are not meeting the Nyquist sampling requirements for this input. And what we wound up doing was redoing our grid and pushing the higher resolution all the way to the day side. And then we were able to reproduce everything from, from that Claude Pierre study, no problem. So this is an example of, can your code even handle the inputs that you're handing it? There are other considerations, IMFBX, um, if you're using non-ideal MHD, you have more state variables that you need to specify and things like that. Um, but I'm going to shuffle along here. Oh, boy, this is a fun one. Has anybody ever read Steve Morley's 2018 paper? Oh, it's fantastic. Uh, he makes the point I made earlier that this is the Earth. This is the magnetosphere. This is the orbit of ACE. And this is all to scale. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, so what you be maybe measuring here might not hit the Earth. What you measure here might evolve on the way there. So Steve did, and other people are now replicating the study and building on it. Steve correlated what they saw here with what was measured right in front of the Earth and got distributions of values. So if you saw, let's say 400 kilometers per second at ACE, you could have a you know, 20 to 40 kilometer per second error bar. And same thing with um, density and, excuse me, this is BZ and BY and density and things like that. There's actually a range of possibilities at Earth because there's error there. And that's really hard to overcome. In that paper, we solved it by doing ensemble forecast using the SWMF and seeing how that affected our results. Okay, so a real quick set of takeaways just for upstream boundary conditions. Uh, keep in mind the goals of your study and know what's important to you going in. Um, assess your upstream data thoroughly, looking for gaps. Consider different sources than just OmniWeb. I love OmniWeb, but there are limitations there. And be honest in your presentations and publications about the limitations inherent in your study. Finally, seek a domain expert. Right, find an instrument PI or a model developer to help you consider things. And that's gonna make you a stronger scientist as well. Okay, um, inner boundary conditions. I'm gonna run out of time, but this one's a lot of fun. Uh, MHG inner boundary conditions are not in the ionosphere. They're usually somewhere between you know two and three RE out there. This is a run where I had it pretty close to the inner boundary for reasons, and this, Part we don't solve for, you'll hear it called is the gap region. As inputs to our model, we are responsible for setting the state variables across that entire boundary, right? And so this is kind of the typical way things are done if you just pull the code out of the box and hit go. Uh, mass density and pressure. Some codes will do a constant uniform inner boundary condition in those variables. Some will set a hard wall so that no mass can pass through the inner boundary. Magnetic field, 
dipole magnetic field. Love it. Uh, radial velocity, more often than not, that's set to zero. And then the tangential velocity, the velocity along the inner boundary, the most common thing today, overwhelmingly, is to set it to match the convection speed in your ionosphere, right? And that's where ionosphere magnetosphere coupling, that's how it happens when you couple codes together. Hey, do these values matter? And we're gonna start by talking about inner boundary density, because that, that's, my, that's my favorite one. Uh, it turns out that even if your radial velocity is zero, and you have Dirichlet inner boundary conditions or constant inner boundary conditions for our density, this is rho IB, and you look just a few grid cells away from the inner boundary, you will get dynamic plasma outflow. These plots were looking down at the earth at a shell of three RE. So that's, I think uh, this was eight grid cells away from the inner boundary for this particular run. And the sun is to the right, the, you know, this is midnight. The colors are showing you flux, mass flux, either upward in red or downward in blue. And we see kind of a, like for southward IMF, we see like a pseudo cusp. We see kind of this auroral related like outflow. It's dynamic, it's spatially complex. Holy smokes. Uh, it turns out that this scales with your inner boundary density and activity. So this is, uh, we did a bunch of runs where we went from northward to uh, southward IMF. We see our fluence. This is the total number of particles per second leaving the inner boundary change with time and scale with our inner boundary density from 0 0.1 all the way to 500. And this is a log scale. And these, this mass populates the inner magnetosphere. Now I, I cheated, this is from the multi-fluid run, but everybody looks surprised for a second. Whoa. Uh, and so you can see like this is stuff that goes in and populates the lobes, the plasma sheet, the inner magnetosphere, all from a simple choice of inner boundary condition. Fun story. Early in uh, MHD days, you had the LFM group with a hard wall inner boundary condition looking at how solar wind enters the magnetosphere and they got great results. And then you looked at a similar study by the gang from UCLA who used Dirichlet boundary conditions. And they're saying, hey, a bunch of this comes from the inner boundary, that's probably ionospheric outflow. And they're both right. And it was just a difference of inner boundary inputs. Okay, so this is the slide where I was going to show you all the ways that this changes simulation results. But there's a lot. So instead, I'm gonna show you a cool video of a multi-fluid run and just show you some references on this topic from a talk I gave in like 2016. Um, oh, that's cool. Let's see, let's see, here comes our solar wind fluid. Oh, that wraps around there. That's kind of cool. The blue stuff is ionosphere stuff. So it really kind of dictates the inner, uh, Plasma sheet, wow, that's a very short list. There's a lot of ways, it's really complex. It changes everything from your development of your ring current all the way to your cross polar cap potential in your ionosphere, which you would never expect, all based on your choice of inner boundary conditions. I have five minutes left, we can do this. Our last case study is related to inner boundary conditions of MHD, and that's your ionospheric electrodynamic solvers. These, there's a whole family of these things. They're almost all the exact same thing. You're solving this equation, this Poisson-like equation where your goal is to get electric potential using some specification of ionospheric conductance and some specification of field aligned current distribution, right? You're kind of like doing Ohm's law in 2D. Uh, we're gonna use an iterative minimal residual method to converge to a solution. Yet yeah, see this dynamics, it's actually electrostatic. People use that to sound cool, but it's literally an electrostatic solution. Um, and these are almost always coupled to MHD to set the tangential inner boundary conditions, right? Because the potential is setting, that's indicative of your E cross B drift there. And that's what you want your inner boundary condition to be in your MHD code. 
what are the inputs? I'm almost out of time, so I'll give you the answer. Initial conditions, it's a static code. Just start with anything, no one cares. Boundary conditions, uh, zero potential at the equator. Source and loss terms, we don't have any of that. Variables not solved for. We have field line currents, and we typically grab that from our MHD solution. And then we have conductance that comes from magic. So, okay, mini rant. There's basically two ways to get conductance in the field right now, okay? And they're both not great because it's a very hard value to obtain even with observations. You can try to estimate the precipitating population from the magnetosphere using your MHD code, but this involves a lot of assumptions. And then you use a uh, relationship developed by Bob Robinson's, the Robinson formula. That's was radar observations from three events. Yeah. That basically says if you have this energy flux in, your conductance is that. It turns out to be a pretty good relationship, but it's three events. Or, and this is what the SWMF does, this is a, um, Aaron Ridley actually put this together, and now Bob Robinson's doing his own version of it, which is really cool. You create an empirical relationship between field aligned current strength at one point and conductance. Now, when Aaron built this relationship, he used one month of quiet time data, foreshadowing. Input data for relationships, all those empirical relationships I just talked about, we have to keep that in mind here. And I did keep it in mind. I was looking at the results from the SWPSI CCMC validation challenge, and I, I asked, why aren't we doing better? And I started by looking at the distribution of activity for the storms included in that event. So this is a box and whisker plot. 50% of all the points lie in the box. The median is here. And then these are outliers out there, depending on your definition of outlier. And the values here are sim H, it's high time resolution DST, such that strong activity is here and weak activity is over here. Two of the codes were purely empirical. And they, oh yeah, sorry, I should say the, the extreme is the Halloween storm there. The Weimer and Weigel models used a broad set of data to develop their relationships, including the November 2003 storm, which is also very strong. But you'll notice that their distributions are highly skewed towards weak activity. If you look at the conductance models used in the other codes, the Ridley relationship, two months of quiet, or one month of quiet time data, and the Robinson three storms. There's no extremes. There's no strong storms. Every time you do that, you are actually extrapolating. Um, a former student of mine, Agnet Mukhopadhyay, took this up and reformed this relationship using a year's worth of data from 2003 and extending this distribution. We are still reaping the benefits of that at Michigan. We have much better AE into rural activity in our code. Um, we're getting better DBDTs. It's really amazing, but we have a lot of work to do. The relationships used in these codes have a stronger physics basis when you're pulling, trying to estimate precipitation from the MHD codes. We in the field are trying to work through some of the assumptions and limitations inherent in those approaches as well. So ionospheric conductivity or conductance is a, a really fun topic right now. Oh. I had an animation there I keep forgetting about. Uh, I'm just about out of time. Suffice to say that when you couple models together and create really cool flow charts that nobody actually reads when you put them on the screen, you're, doing the, you're, you're going through the process of trying to use different models together to overcome limitations on inputs or to you know, act as your inputs for different models. And when you have two-way relationships, you're, you're letting one input affect the other model and vice versa. It's really cool. You get some very neat nonlinear behavior that oftentimes is revealing to some of the, the processes and relationships in here. So model coupling is really cool. It's not just done in the SWMF, but like I think I'm legally 
obligated to push the SWMF once every five minutes or something like that. So, uh, fantastic. So I'm right on time. Real quick takeaways to wrap this up. Model inputs are values or data sets required to run a simulation or to build an empirical or machine learning relationship. Think upstream values, think boundary conditions, think anything, and think beyond just solar wind inputs or geomagnetic indices. Um, all your inputs have consequences in the model results. Critically consider the role each choice may have, be open and honest about the limitations, and evaluate everything with respect to the goal of the study. Hey, we're using really smooth time interpolated solar wind inputs, but we're looking at net energy input, not small fluctuations. So we're not worried about that. Or if you're writing a paper or your thesis, you say that's for a future study. And then the reviewer will say, um, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Questions? When you were presenting the models, you said in order to calculate the conductance, you use one month of quiet data. Mm -hmm. Generally, the INS5 varies on a seasonal basis, and it also varies in terms of location. So how do you determine which particular data to use? Is the data fixed, or does it vary? <laughs> Well, that's a really good question, and the answer is complicated. I'm going to repeat it back to you, make sure I understand, because I'm a slow person. Just The question is, we have these relationships. How do we determine, how, how are those, to what degree do those relationships change, or how do we determine if those relationships should change based on spatial location or position in the storm, essentially? Um, the answer is complicated. Um, part of it is the inputs to those relationships really are position and, and location dependent. So for example, with the, the Ridley approach where you have field line currents and then you get conductance, your field line currents move and vary in latitude into the phase of storm. So that kind of helps bake it in there, but it also reflects the limitation of the empirical data set used. When Aaron built that relationship, he did make it a function of the latitude and longitude, but not activity. So there you have to be careful. With the, the Robinson approach, it's a much more complicated system because you have your inner boundary, you have your state variables for your MHD. You need to turn that into, instead of moments of a fluid, temperature, density, to, you need to turn that into a distribution. You need to assume a portion of that is in the loss cone. Um, you need to use the night relationship to accelerate that, uh, that pre uh, diffuse precipitation to get a, uh, to account for any potential drops along the field line. So all of that is going to have activity blended in with the MHD results and where you are in latitude and longitude and, and storm time. Uh, but the Robinson formula really was built that that last step that takes you from precipitating energy flux to conductance um, is, is just two equations. Um, but it's, it's turned out to be very robust. There have been a number of studies that have expanded the data set and expanded the, uh, the, the formulations. And it, it changes, it improves, but it doesn't change drastically. So it's so the short answer to your question is some of the dynamics of the system are baked in in the way we're modeling. And some of it you're definitely seeing the limitations reflected in different parts of the approach that don't account for that. A lot of the early conductivity would just assume the boundary was a, a copper ball, yes. uniform, <laughs> infinite yes. conductor. There's you can question. pull those papers out and they're like, one day we hope to have an ionosphere. Right. Hi, uh, very fun talk. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, when we are using uh, the L1 data to drive the models, yeah. it's uh, basically now casting, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. we'll not have much time to run the MHD models. When you're trying to do forecasting with uh, results from simulations like NLIL or Euphoria, they usually give us a smooth data yes. uh, time series. And as you pointed out, regals matter. 
So do, does your team have some insights on to how to deal with these things or are they looking towards? That's a really great question because I have an answer for it. <laughs> great. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I actually have, you know, I have one of those papers sitting on my desk that I need to finish and submit where we took results from uh, the space weather modeling framework forecasting from uh, WSA out to L1 and then seeing how that impacts DBDT. Uh, a study that Gabor Toth once described at, well, presenting my results, once described as to do this kind of forecast, you either need to be brave or stupid. Fortunately, we have Dan Welling. <laughs> I said to him the other day, he goes, I never said anything like that. I'm like, oh, whatever. Um, it turns out, and we, we did that, and we also uh, did another uh, an empirical forecasting CME set that included some of that noise artificially. That one performed better. So that, that noise and structure and the steep gradients are very important. That was kind of what spurred our ideas for Sophie's research with the hope there, that the next step is that we are able to um, kind of quantify that activity and reapply it to otherwise smooth inputs to improve DBDT. Now, overall, that's, that's for the use case of trying to predict brown magnetic disturbances, you know, magnetometer things at the surface. Overall, DST looks great, KP looks great, so we're getting the gross features of the magnetosphere really well without that structure. So it really does, again, come down to use case. I, I tend to be an optimist. I think that we can do some long-term forecasting stuff when we bring these models together that will be useful for the community, but I, I am an optimist. Yeah, I don't know if this is relevant to the scales of your models, but apparently magnetic reconnection can be difficult to model. Yes. I'm just curious, like, is, is, is that a problem for your model? Is it, or does it just emerge naturally? Do you have to treat it like in a specific way? So, uh, Jimmy Relator once described this as the miracle of MHD. I was sitting next to Gabor Toth, who is, uh, if you don't know Gabor, is a very uh, dry sense of humor and a, a deep knowledge of numerical physics. He goes, it is not magic, you know, it is, it is numerical diffusion that is well quantified depending on the solver and the gradients between two, you know, and all that. So in ideal MHD, you don't get reconnection. In discretized ideal, pseudo ideal MHD here, it appears as numerical diffusion, right? When you apply your flux limiters in that, it's a term that is related to the fastest wave speed, local wave speed at the time, and the grid spacing and the time step, right? So it gets better, it gets less when you have more grid resolution, but it depends on the gradient and the, the fastest local wave speed. The miracle of MHD that Jimmy Rader talked about is the fact that overall, MHD does a great job of capturing the overall energy delivery from the solar wind and IMF, including reconnection, into the magnetosphere, right? We get that energy delivery really well. Uh, I strongly suspect, and this is something that I my, myself and a grad student of, and I are, are starting to look at now, I strongly suspect that we get the reconnection rate terrible. That's not a suspicion, we know that's true. But the system compensates for that with the different shapes and sizes of the reconnection zone to maintain that energy transfer. That's kind of my working hypothesis right now. Now. Again, all depends on what you're looking at. If you're comparing to MMS for reconnection events, if then you have to do something more like embed a PIC in that region. And there's, there's MHD with embedded PIC and things like that you can do, or you can just do straight PIC or something that captures fundamentally that reconnection physics. But the magnetic induction equation, the DBDT with oh, yeah, there's diff there. diffusion plus transport, you noticed in this, that diffusion was not there. Yeah. <laughs> it was just transport. And but that I, I, eta is some rounding error in your numerical code that magically, as Jimmy Rader would say, but uh, great. I, I, would, I would caution, I, I'll very much caution to, to not say rounding error or, <laughs> or solver error or something like that, because I, it gives a very 
it, it's not a floating point issue. It, it really is something that you have some control over in the solver that is proportional to um, the solver and the gradients and, and the fastest local wave speed. So it's, 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 it's a characteristic of the solver. It, it's not like, oh, well, if we went from uh, single to double precision floating points, then, you know. So I, I, I have a, a standing argument with Joe Borowski about this, who knows the right answer, absolutely, but will say numerical error. And I say, no, in the background, so. Yeah, there's a term LPU. Anybody know LPU? least publishable unit, right? So if you're trying to maximize your body of work, you try to break up your studies into this. If I can publish two papers instead of one, and I know nobody reads long papers, so I might as well have two shorter papers. I've always had model envy. I could just SWMF with one eighth RE grid, paper one with a corridor grid, paper two. Okay. And so also think about we're now open in the open uh, discussion for uh, both Nick and Dan. So you're talking about the SD and KP index, uh, but what about AE index? Like, because that hasn't effect on the INRS here. Oh, AE index sucks. Uh, <laughs> And my 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 bias is there is AE index. My my bias comes from trying to reproduce it from MHD as a way to assess our ability to get auroral currents well, especially during substorms, which is a big challenge. And um, so changing the conductance, Agnet's work actually improved that. Really neat. Um, as an input. I'll say this, be careful with, with, and we should say this about KP. I have grudges against KP for a lot of reasons. Remember what those indices are, okay? AE, the Auroral Electrojet Index, is uh, 11 magnetometers, correct? Or is it 13? 13, 13. KP, it's 11. And you're basically plotting the north-south component of all these magnetometers on top of each other and then taking the upper envelope and the lower envelope and subtracting the two. Now, what do you think the chances are to, to basically you're supposed to be getting like the strongest eastward and strongest westward current perturbation. What do you think the chances are that 11 magnetometers in the Northern hemisphere capture that, right? And you see this when you, uh, the people at SuperMag have their SuperMag AE indices that use dozens to hundreds of magnetometers to produce the same thing and get a different result. So, in, I could go on. I instituted virtual KP and MHD, and that was a lot of reading to some really weird alchemy I never want to reproduce. Uh, suffice to say, it's like using MHD to produce KP is like turning on a big rig semi truck to just so you can listen to the AM radio. It's just ridiculous. Um, keep in mind the limitations of those observations. Same thing with DST and uh, sim h versus dst or i think super mag has a version of that as well you know know the limitations of your inputs absolutely point i wish i would have made me here oh gosh great Thank so you. we we're going to have a 10 minute break we'll come back at 25 after for the open q a
Um, I want to just try to get your opinion. I don't think it ended up being much better than it was. I thought it might have been, but I remember it was related to the research. So yeah. Did you get a little bit of notice? I said I do it differently. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? I do it with him about less. Oh, okay. Like if you're a good one,
You can tell there's like lots of cat yeah, and chat experience in this place. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I really enjoy it. Like, I'm not a model, but I really enjoy doing the meetings because I learn a lot from the half people to that. <laughs> One of the advantages of being a experienced Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's really good. I mean, just, yeah, just hearing come off like kind of roommates. Don't be serious, won't be nice. Perturbation. <laughs> yeah. It's not then you're, <laughs> then you're like, oh, we're about to get happy. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a stage for this. No. Wherever you want. Um, but uh, yeah, I think feel free to stand. And I'll see you at yeah. Okay, everyone, if we can gather back. You can be up front or you can just uh, and feel free free to chime in on questions uh, both ways. Okay, everyone, uh, now that you 